Cal. Uh, we'll each give you a little bit of a brief introduction. We'll talk a little bit about the history of Supermetrics as a bootstrap company and then the decision to raise venture capital. Um, you heard pretty much what you needed to know about me. I'll just calibrate on two things so you understand the perspective I'm bringing. In the last 12 years, I've funded about 80 companies as a seed investor. I'm now a Series A and B investor for NEA. NEA is about a $20 billion fund, one of the largest in the world about 1,000 portfolio companies, about 225 of which have gotten public. The companies that I invested in, I helped raise their Series A, and that process has really helped me to understand sort of what can and cannot help a company that's considering raising venture capital. Quick introduction from you. Yes, so uh, nine years ago, I used to work at a gaming company here in Finland called Sulake uh, at the marketing department, and I was struggling with getting all this marketing data together I was spending a, a large part of my time actually copy-pasting numbers into Excel. And then I saw this guy, uh, a Google guy, saying that the first guy to automate that gets this T-shirt. And I figured that I'm not a developer, but that can't be too difficult. So I automated that process that, there at that company. And it was, uh, turned out really well at that company. So I figured there's got to be a business opportunity uh, with the same idea. So I left the company, and I founded a business uh, based on that idea. And now we are one of the fastest growing startups here in, in Finland with a global client base of uh, over 10,000 companies. Excellent. And Mikael and I met because an entrepreneur I had funded now works for him. It seems like an excellent place to work. So just two quick questions uh, to understand a little bit. Could people please tell me by raise of hands how many founders are in the room? Great. I'm also one. And people that are investors. Okay, dominantly founders. So secondly, how many people here believe they know the reality of venture economics? That's a very small number. So I'm going to spend a moment on that because I think it's very important to understanding the decision you make when you consider fundraising. The way venture capital works in its most simplest form is that investors, LPs, give us money to go out and invest in companies. When we invest in those companies, we are compensated if we return more money than the investors gave us. So NEA currently, the current fund is $3.3 billion. As soon as we've delivered back $3.3 billion to our LPs, the next dollar we get to take part in the profits of. And that's important to understand because until you return that fund, you're not making any material amount of personal wealth for yourself and your partners. So when you look at venture capital and you think about whether you might be a fit for them, understand that any business they invest in has to have the opportunity to be material to that fund. If you're at a smaller fund, call it a $500 million fund, it's likely that a top partner will want to believe that any company they invest in could return the entire fund if it works out. And if you think about that math, a venture capitalist will own typically 20 to 30% of a company. So if you have, as an example, a $500 million outcome, which is certainly a material outcome, the venture capital firm would receive $100 million. And if they have $500 million to return to their partners, there's a question whether or not that is material yet. So the number one thing I'd encourage you to think about, the size of fund and the goals they have have to be aligned with your own goals and desires as an entrepreneur, and we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later. So, you spent a bunch of time bootstrapping. You then decided to raise a round. Why don't you sort of take us through the experience of bootstrapping and then talk a little bit about why you made the decision to raise capital? Right. So when I first started the company, I had, I had uh, no experience in uh, running a business or starting a business. And I had actually no idea how to, how to run a business. I was not active in the startup circles. So I actually thought that to run a business, you need to make a profit uh, to keep the business uh, afloat. And only later did I learn that actually um, most startups don't operate that way, but they constantly make a loss and then they try to find funding to cover that loss. Uh, and that's also when I learned the term bootstrapping and that I was doing that. Uh, and when I learned that, uh, I figured that actually it's, it's pretty good uh, 
good approach to do this bootstrapping, because then you can focus fully on what's most important, uh, building a great product and, 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 and ensuring that you can monetize that product, because you need to get the money to keep the company running. You don't have external funding to, to rely on. Uh, whereas many startups, I think they are spending a lot of time trying to secure these in investments, uh, and that is a distraction from the most important thing, which is building the great product. So you bootstrap for how long before you decide to raise capital? Originally, since I started this as a side project in uh, 2010, I uh, run this as a side project for three years, and after that, uh, from 2013 to last year, so four years as a real company, I bootstrapped. And last year, then we raised that 3.5 million round from Open Ocean Capital. And when you raise that round, and I'll also sort of along the way, sort of maybe give you the inside mind of how I would have thought about things at different stages, because you know it gives you sort of a perspective of how venture might think. What did the company look like when you went out to raise, and, and sort of both, how did that appeal, and why did it convince you that? that extra capital venture could bring was important. So right, so I, I was uh, committed to this bootstrapping. I, I was not going to raise money. I, I was sure I'm not going to ra raise money. But two years ago, I participated in the pitching competition here just to gain some visibility for the company to help in our recruitment. Uh, our marketing guy said that would be a good idea. And after that pitching competition, a lot of uh, investors started contacting us and uh, said that they would like to, to invest. And you know, I had meetings with them, and, and some of them convinced me that there is value that they can add to us. Like, even though we have a profitable company, that we didn't really need the investment uh, for financial reasons. There are other reasons uh, to take an investment, and they, uh, that they can help us grow the company much faster than, than we could on our own. Uh, at the time, we had a small team. I think when we started the discussions with the VCs, we had just seven people in the team. Uh, quite an inexperienced team. Myself, I'm of course a first-time founder. Uh, so I think we really needed some uh, uh, strong advisors on the background to help us help us grow to the next level. Yeah, I'll just comment on a couple of things you said in terms of how, on the venture capital side, I would think about the opportunity and also things that entrepreneurs might want to consider. You know, the most the strongest possible situation you can be in as a founder is to not have to raise, but to be able to get advantage from doing so. You know, the, the sort of most competitive rounds tend to be the ones where the venture capitalist is selling the value they can create, and the entrepreneur has their choice. And in a perfect world, they don't need the money except to accelerate. The reality of venture is that because you, you need these sort of outsized returns, it's often easier to invest post-momentum you know, once the company is sort of off the ground and running towards, towards the sky. And so you tend to look for a couple of things. You know, venture loves velocity, it loves speed of growth, and it really dislikes friction. So maybe just talk about, it took you a little longer than some, because you bootstrapped, you know, yep. oftentimes people equate the longer it takes to reach a certain milestone, the harder it becomes to raise capital. What were sort of some of the key metrics, revenue-wise or otherwise, when you went out to raise? So at the time, we were uh, growing at around 100% uh, year on year. So a uh, healthy growth rate, but not uh, super high. Uh, but I think what made us really interesting to the VCs was that we also had a 60% profit margin. So it was a re really profitable business. And we already had a huge client base uh, across the world with uh, companies like Uber and Alibaba and uh, Dyson and like really big companies that we had gotten without a sales team, so just with inbound leads. So clearly we had a very good product. And, and with these big companies uh, being clients of us at a very low price point, I think any investor can see that uh, there is a lot of room to grow these clients into some, something much higher. So it was not just about the numbers, but I think uh, the opportunity with the client base we already had and, and, and how clear it was that the product uh, has a big market. So that's also something that's always fascinating that I've looked at a lot, and I think entrepreneurs sort of see from the outside is they'll, they'll see companies getting funded, and they'll, they'll either be surprised or considered obvious. Um, I've seen rounds get funded at all types of revenue. It almost always, though, and has embedded it in a relatively aggressive growth rate. You know, the, the growth of the company and sort of the exiting ARR is usually critically important because if it's, a, particularly for a later stage round, you're raising, in essence, sort of a small Series A, 
you know, when you go into sort of a Series B, it's sort of the model of fuel on the fire. You know, this is where you've figured out the market, you know how you're going to sell it, and that extra money, when it gets applied, is going to be sort of repeating what you've already done. There's different types of rounds. There's, if you think about this, every round is about the next round. The seed round that one raises, and, and speak up if you feel differently here, the seed round allows you to prove a thesis. It doesn't allow you to build a business. Whether you're bootstrapping or raising seed capital, you're proving that what you want to offer the world is valuable to the world and that they want to buy that. When you prove that thesis adequately, that's what's going to allow you to raise a Series A. And a Series A is going to allow you to really start to build that business. You take that thesis that was in the lab, you take it into the real world, and you start repeating it. A Series B is now almost exclusively fuel on the fire. It's working. You grow the sales force, and you just multiply the numbers out. So what stage you are in as a company is very important to sort of the size and the purpose of the capital. But you're not just getting capital. In a perfect world, while I will never pretend that the, the venture capitalist is as important as the entrepreneur, I was an entrepreneur for 25 years. I, used, I always used to be quizzical about how anybody that wasn't an entrepreneur could become a VC. And I've learned that people that weren't entrepreneurs can be very, very good VCs. They can add an enormous amount of value. But 99 point some percentage of the time, the entrepreneur is doing all the work. So the venture capitalist wants to show value beyond capital, and they talk to you about that a lot. Maybe talk a bit about what value beyond the capital has your venture firm brought to you, and what has the capital allowed you to do either differently or in, as an accelerant that's been material, and whether that was a positive all in. Yes, so there, like I said, we had a rather inexperienced team when we raised the money. And I think all the advice that Open Ocean has been able to give us uh, has been really, really helpful for us to, to grow the business. And we have, uh, since raising this investment, uh, managed to, to grow the uh, team uh, at a much, more, much faster pace. And we have also gotten the revenue growth rates at a, at a much, uh, much higher uh, trajectory. Uh, so there's the advice, uh, there's the help in recruitment, so they uh, have helped us in, in, in several key, key recruitments. Uh, bringing our CTO, for example, to the team, a really, really uh, uh, important hire. And uh, also, I think uh, just raising the, the investment, uh, it gives you some credibility, I think, uh, to, that you have uh, managed to raise the, the investment. So even if you have a very profitable company, just having someone like Open Ocean backing it up, uh, I think that helps in, in both sales and, and recruitment. And, Especially here in, in Finland, I, I guess it's the same in Silicon Valley. If, if you want to get some media visibility, you kind of have to raise funding because, uh, you know, if, you, if a startup makes a million in profit, that's, that's uh, not interesting. But if you raise, you know, 200K investment, that's uh, big news. So I think that's, <laughs> how, that's how it works somehow. So when we raised the investment, that was the first time we ac the media actually noticed that mm. we, uh, we exist. Yeah, there's, I've, and by the way, please feel free to send in questions. This topic is somewhat broad, and we're talking about the lens of one person's experience, but you, know, you could argue there's many different versions of that, so happy to address them for either of us. We've got two. Um, one of the things I've noticed pretty consistently, we funded a company at NEA here in Europe called Go Euro, and I was in Berlin before I came to this event, and somebody came up to me and said, I want you to know the reason I took that job was because you funded the company. Not I personally, but NEA. And he said that gave, even though the company was doing quite well, we funded, I think, believe in the Series B, uh, seeing that they had brought in tier one venture capital gave them a new level of confidence. Right. So, assumedly, and you, can, you said this a bit, and maybe we can speak to it a bit more, but raising institutional capital can give you another level of certainly media exposure and credibility. Every place is different. You know, my understanding is Finland has a slightly more conservative view of sort of, will I get paid in two years? Are you going to be there for me? Mm -hmm. um, when I was running my startup that I took public in New York, it was the same thing. You had to recruit people that most of them were, um, most of my engineers were Russian living in New York, outside of New York, and they wanted to make sure they had a job long term. Having that capital is a great endorsement. Have you found it being material? I mean, it, I hear great things about you as a place to work, but does it become easier to hire because of the funding? Yeah, definitely. So there is both the direct help they give with, through their networks, uh, finding good people for us, and then the indirect help we get through the media exposure and, and having that credibility of having, having them as backers. That's another important thing. I think venture firms, at least in the United States, have started to really focus a lot of additional resources 
into what are often called portfolio services. So as an example, at NEA, we have multiple people that help with recruiting. Um, you know, their job is to go out constantly. In fact, they're gone so much, I almost never see them because they're constantly looking for top talent that they can introduce to our entrepreneurs. Uh, I've got a PR team that helps uh, in that way. You know, our entrepreneurs will sometimes call and ask to spend time with uh, the legal team. There's been a lot of movement towards trying to create more value. Um, one of the things I've found interesting is that, you know, an entrepreneur can spend six, nine months, sometimes 12 months getting to the right person in the right organization. So one of the things I've spent a lot of time on that NEA does quite a bit of is to find the right people inside a large organization so we can help you get to that person right away. They may or may not buy your product, but you get that access, that saves you an enormous amount of time. And the currency of being a venture capitalist is an interesting one because you can get pretty interesting meetings. Have you found that the connections on to potential partners, uh, customers has been valuable from your VCs? Yes, definitely. So we have uh, got a good sales meetings through them uh, to uh, big media agencies, advertising agencies. That's been really helpful. And also we have with partner companies such as uh, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Google. They have been, uh, they have wide networks and they can really help. So when we, uh, when I decided that I'm gonna uh, go raise an investment, I, I decided to go with a Finnish VC because they are close by and we can work really closely with them uh, because I mostly raised for the advice that they can give to us. But I also wanted someone that has uh, wide networks outside Finland. And I think Open Ocean was pretty perfect for that because they are very, very well networked in, uh, in both Europe and, and the US. Okay, we've got half a dozen questions. Um, the first one is if you have a one and a half million dollar contract, I assume that means annual volume with a 50% in ARR and the rest in NRE, do you bootstrap or focus on operations and raise your A round? There's a bunch of little things I'm gonna bake into this answer and I'll answer some very specifically, I'll throw you some as well. Uh, NRE is a relatively dangerous thing for venture-backed startups in that there are very few exceptions of where venture capitalists will fund what I would term a body shop where in order for you to grow, you have to just add headcount over and over and over again. You know, the optimal situation is when you see repeatable revenue, very high margins, and not having to do NRE to get to it. Now, in fairness, often you have to do NRE early on, but the quicker you can get to productizing the business, the better. If you are growing a consulting shop, it wouldn't occur to me that that's a venture viable business. Palantir is probably the one exception I can think of, and there's an exception to disprove every rule. Uh, the second po thing I'd point out is this million and a half dollar revenue run rate, in this case it might be a single contract. If it's a single contract, you have absolute concentration risk. I had a company I took out to help raise. I thought they were doing phenomenally well. Their growth was great. I took it to a VC when I was a seed investor and he said, it's all great, they have two clients. I can't do that. I have to wait till they've broadened it. So, you know, you have to get, you, you, anybody can get one phenomenal contract. Could be your brother, could be luck showing that it's repeatable and showing you can get a variety of types of customers is pretty important. The other point I'll make is that it used to be, if you go back sort of three or four years ago, if you were in a, at least in the United States, in a SaaS business, and you could get to about a million dollars of revenue run rate in a year, you'd have a lot of people pay attention and fund that Series A. Today, I would argue that number has gone up significantly. Three is better, five is better than that. So the bar, and again, I'm talking about US venture capital that might be different here, is getting higher and higher and higher. There is no amount that's too much. But the exit velocity is also important. If you took three years to get to $4 million in revenue, that's very different than if you took 18 months. Um, all right, you get to get a question. Did you get the t-shirt and do you still have it? I hope I still have the t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I may have thrown it away, actually. It's a valuable souvenir. <laughs> I started a public company on a napkin, and I just um, realized the other day, I don't think I have that napkin, which makes me sort of sad. Um, the company is having a critical cash flow issue. VC is willing to help, but ask for veto rights as they believe they know what's best. Will you accept the offer? That is a hard one. Um, so the company I took public never raised venture capital. If I had raised venture capital, I would have been fired and our company would have gone bankrupt. Instead, I was able to take it private and it was a great outcome for myself and everybody else involved but only because I had control and was willing not to do what they asked me to do, my board. My board were not professional venture capitalists or investors, and therefore they were more challenging to work with. 
Um, professional investors are pretty straightforward. They have specific expertise from their background. You know, you, you want to think about where you're getting advice from. Are you getting it from somebody's experience? That's highly valuable. Are you getting it from their opinion? That's highly questionable. Are you getting it from some hearsay? That's dangerous to you. But the point here on veto rights, I've never seen a US venture round done at Series A or beyond where you didn't have veto rights in terms of a sale of the company or a future fundraising. And the reason for this, and this is sort of super critical, I'm gonna tell one really quick story. I met two women who had started a fascinating business that I liked a lot. I didn't think it was venture scale. And I suggested that they consider not raising venture capital. About six months later, I ran into them and they said they had actually gotten a term sheet for $8 million. And what did I think? My response was, I think you should talk to the VC and find out what they believe success would be. Because I thought that business would get bought, and I told them this, that they would probably have the opportunity to sell that business for $20 million, sometimes in the next two to three years, because it was particularly interesting at that moment in time, and there were a lot of buyers. They took the money, $8 million, and two years later, I was working out with the guy that funded them, and I asked how it had gone, and he said, it was a disaster. It was a disaster because they had been offered $20 million for the company, they wanted to take it, and he had absolutely no interest in doing that. And his response to them was, what do you think I'm in this for? And so he had two choices at that point. He could fire the entrepreneur. These were his words. I could fire the entrepreneur and replace them with somebody that could build me a bigger business, or I could just let it go. He chose to let it go in the following way. He said to the entrepreneur, I will let you sell, I will support you, if you get the following. We get paid first, 100% cash, no holdbacks, no escrow, and no warrants or representations. I don't know how many people here have done M&A deals. None of those things are normal. The price that was bid went from 20 to 10. Eight went to the venture capitalist. Two went to the seed investors. The entrepreneurs made nothing, and they got jobs. What was success to those entrepreneurs was that $20 million offer until they took that venture money. That entrepreneur needed something different than the VC needed, and they didn't make that clear in the beginning. And that VC did have veto rights, which are quite standard. So I think the question is less about, or the answer is less about, do you let them have veto rights, and more about, is your investor, no matter what type of investor you have, aligned with what you need to be? There's something inside you that you need to be. That's what you care for. If you come to me and you say, I want to be you know, a multi-billion dollar public company, and we spend the next seven to 10 years working on that, and one day you show up and say, but instead I've changed my mind, I want to sell for $100 million, <laughs> that's not going to work out well. But we should both be very clear with each other in the beginning what that means. So I think that's actually probably the most important thing anybody here should remember. We're down to 20 seconds. So unless you differ with that and you want to say the world's different. I agree with that. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for coming. And feel free to find me. I wear these plaid pants, so it would be easy if you want to ask more or if you want to pitch me your business, because that's what I'm here to hear about. Thank you.